So today is the day that I finally get to check out a new NVIDIA Ada Lovelace 40 series GPU. I unfortunately couldn't get a 4090 to cover its launch, but did manage to get my hands on an RTX 4080 to be able to cover this launch. So my next generation GPU coverage starts here. This video was brought to you by VIP SCD Key. If you head over there using my link in the description box below, you'll find that they offer cheap OEM Windows 10 keys for which you can use my discount code TPC, which gives you 25% off, bringing the price down to 16 US dollars. And once activated, you'll be able to upgrade to Windows 11 for free. They also offer Office 2019, which you'll be able to get for only 49 US dollars using the code TPC. So back to the video. So today I'm taking a look at the palette Midnight Kaleidoscope Game Rock OC RTX 4080 and the first thing that stands out to me is just how huge the box is. Like this is it compared to the last triple fan palette GPU I took a look at on the channel. The 4080 box is massive in comparison. But let's get this box open and take a look at the GPU itself. And I have to say, wow this card is gorgeous. The pictures online really do not do it justice. I was not expecting it to look like this, like wow. And it sparkles when the light hits it, it's just so pretty. <laughs> For many years, I've wanted to do an Ice Gem theme build where you combine a Palette Game Rock GPU with some Trident Z Royals, a Silverstone Ice Gem all in one, and call them Master Prismatic fans. And now that I've got my hands on a Game Rock card, I can try to get hold of the other three and make that build a reality. This cooler is different to last gen's Game Rock one, in that instead of the gems being like a clear crystal, making the card more white in appearance when the RGB's off, this card's theme is what Palette calls Midnight Kaleidoscope and has this darkened gem look. I can't say which one I prefer, as this is the first one I'm seeing in person, but I can say this card is genuinely stunning. And also huge, it's the biggest GPU I've ever seen for sure. It's the same size as Palette's 4090 cooler and yet it only has a TDP of 340 watts. The only difference I can spot between the coolers looking at the specs is that the 4090 uses a vapor chamber whereas the 4080 uses the copper base plate. Here it is against my RTX 3090 Vision, which is a 350 watt card, and the 3080 Founds Edition, which is a 320 watt card. It's a similar length to the 3090, but quite a bit thicker. What's scary to me is looking at various measurements online, this may actually be one of the smaller 4080s at launch. So I can safely say before even testing it that this 4080 Game Rock card has a pretty overkill cooler. But the thing is, I actually really like this. The benefits of a large cooler like this is that the GPU should run cooler and therefore quieter and hopefully stay in its zero RPM silent fan mode for longer. The downsides though are case compatibility and price. You're not going to be fitting this card into a small form factor case of any ease and you'll even struggle with some mid-tower cases. And a giant cooler like this has to be more expensive to produce than a more conventional sized card and that cost will be passed on to the consumer. But just like with the RTX 3080, where you could get everything from compact cards to significantly larger ones, my hope is that as this generation continues, we'll see a wide range of 4080 card sizes and that therefore everyone will be catered to. But touring the card, it has three 90mm fans, bringing air to its chunky heatsink, and given the orientation of the fins, the hot air will be exhausting into your case with very minimal rear exhaust. This card is 3.5 slots thick, but only uses three slots in your case, and only two of them actually secure into the holes in your motherboard tray. This looks a little odd, but I think it's been done to increase case compatibility, perhaps with two slot vertical GPU mounts. For outputs, there's three DisplayPort 1.4a ports and one HDMI 2.1a port. I know people have been disappointed with the lack of DisplayPort 2.1 ports, but personally, 4K 120Hz is likely where I stay for the lifetime of this card, so I'm not concerned. But if you're a competitive gamer looking to hit those higher frame rates and high resolution, this could be something that matters to you for sure. The 4080 Game Rock OC has a really nice brushed metal backplate with this really cute glittery Game Rock logo on it. The card has an inner metal frame which together makes this GPU feel really solid. It's like a brick. If it wasn't filled with holes, you could build a very expensive house with it. The backplate has a large airflow pass-through cutout area. Some cards do have entirely open backplate holes here, but this grille design looks great and doesn't look like it would be too restrictive for airflow to cause any issues. Over here there's a BIOS switch, allowing you to switch between a performance and silent mode. I will be giving this a test later, 
But the big advantage here for me is stress-free FreeBIOS flashing. You can experiment with this card and know you've always got a backup BIOS if anything goes wrong. To power this card, there's a single 16-pin, 12-volt high power power connector. And in the box, there's an included adapter. This means that, unlike what AMD would have you believe, you can just install this card and run it without needing to upgrade your power supply. This power connector has been a source of great controversy recently, and I do think there's enough cases of them failing for the need for detailed investigations into the course to be done. However, I'm not particularly concerned, and think I would run even a 4090 in my own PC 24-7 without it keeping me up at night worrying. The good news is that as this is a much lower wattage card, the chances of running into any issues with the power adapter or power cables to this GPU should be substantially lower. So, I've managed to secure an Asus RTX 4090 Strix OC for testing, but it arrives on a Monday, and this video is due for Tuesday, so I'll attempt to include as much as I possibly can with last minute testing, but it might not happen. Um, I'm also going to be using my RTX 3080 Founders Edition and Gigabyte RTX 3090 Vision for general comparisons. And I'll be testing on an i9-12900K powered system, using an Asus Z690 Prime motherboard and a 32GB kit of Team Group Delta RGB DDR5 6000 CL40 memory. This is the most powerful system that I have access to, but even though it's only a year old, it may still struggle to keep up with the 40 series cards, even in 4K, which, to be honest, is really the minimum resolution I would pair these cards with anyway. First up is Metro Exodus PC Enhanced Edition, and this is in Ultra Settings. And just like that, my RTX 3090 goes from being a beast to looking mid-range. Although it's worth mentioning that if I didn't make videos on hardware, I would certainly be keeping the 3090 for at least another generation. You should never upgrade just because the new numbers are impressive. Next is Far Cry 6 and Ultra Settings with Ray Tracing on. The RTX 3080 result here really surprised me. I'm using the HD Texture Pack, which actually exceeds the 10 gig VRAM capacity on this card, absolutely tanking its performance. A little warning even came up on the screen saying, hey, you don't have enough VRAM for this. So it's safe to say that the 3080 struggles here, but it was, and still is, considerably cheaper than every other card in this lineup. Next is Forza Horizon 5, and this is running the latest version, which just added ray trace reflections to the player vehicle in free roam and races. This is a very light form of RT, which doesn't affect performance very much. Even though I've turned everything up to absolute maximum, which is above the extreme preset, I still run into some CPU bottlenecking when moving up to the RTX 4080 from the 30 series. And the problem became significantly worse with the 4090, just as you'd expect. So these new cards absolutely have more to give. There's also Assassin's Creed Valhalla in ultra high settings. Here, the 4080 broke past a 100 FPS average. It did in both of these games actually, which is very impressive. But I want you to pay close attention to the difference in performance between the 3080 and the 3090, and then compare that to the difference between the 4080 and the 4090, especially as we move on to tests that aren't CPU bottlenecked. There's a larger gap here between the 4080 and 4090's performance, but the price gap between the 40 series cards is somehow a lot smaller, which places the 4080 in a tough spot to justify. Next is Cyberpunk 2077, and I ran this game twice, once with RT on and once with RT off. Neither of these tests feel representative of real world numbers for me, because you wouldn't play Cyberpunk 2077 with ray tracing off with any of these cards benchmarked here today, and you also wouldn't play in 4K with ray tracing on without taking advantage of DLSS to give playable frame rates. However, I wanted my testing to be suitable for adding in AMD RDNA free cards if I can get them for future videos, so I want my settings that are more synthetic, but are able to be run on both brands' cards. Moving on to Rainbow Six Extraction, which achieved high frame rates and wasn't CPU bottlenecked for the 40 series cards. The 4080 here exceeded the 120Hz capability of my primary gaming display, and the 4090 was able to really stretch its legs, reaching almost 200 frames per second on average. So if frame rates in competitive games have been what's keeping you from making the jump to 4K, it might be time to make the upgrade. Then I tested Horizon Zero Dawn in ultra quality, where you again see an average of over 120fps with the RTX 4080, which is impressive. Moving on to one of my favourite titles for testing the capabilities of modern GPUs, Control, which just had a sequel announced that I'm very excited about. 
As with Cyberpunk, this is another title that anyone playing with an NVIDIA card would almost certainly be using DLSS for, especially when playing with maximum settings like I am here. So these frame rates are lower than how you'd actually play. This is meant to be an RTX 4080 review, but any time its average FPS is below that of the 1% performance of the 4090, it's difficult not to get distracted. Over 60 FPS without DLSS in control. That 4090 really is something. Lastly, the Shadow of the Tomb Raider, in the highest settings with ray tracing on Ultra. And at this point, I think we've got a very clear idea of where the 4080 sits. It's a huge step up from last generation, but doesn't hold its own against the 4090 in the same way that the 3080 did against the 3090. But let's move on to some performance percentage increase graphs. So this is the performance increase for the 4080 compared to last generation's 3080 in all 10 games. There's a 70% average increase in performance, but that includes Far Cry 6, which was running settings that exceeded its female capacity. So ignoring that outlier, you end up with an average gen-on-gen -gen performance increase of 52%. Keep in mind that some of these benchmarks are being held back by my CPU, so it's likely a little above 52% when paired with a new Zen 4 or Raptor Lake CPU. Looking at the percentage performance increase from a 4080 to a 4090, for these 10 games on the 12900K, it was 33%, but I expect it to be closer to 40 with the right CPU. This is a really strange launch to me, because I'm used to seeing diminishing returns at the high end, and we're not seeing that here with a step up to the 4090. I also wanted to take a look at some DLSS performance numbers, so I headed back to Cyberpunk 2077, and tested both the 4080 and 3080 at every level of DLSS available. This is in 4K of ultra settings and ultra ray tracing. As you can see here, if a great looking 60fps game was the target, I'd probably start with DLSS performance mode with the 3080, and then turn down a few settings to increase the FPS a bit. With the 4080, there's no longer any need to decrease settings in performance mode, and I'd be able to take advantage of a variable refresh rate monitor to get a much higher FPS. DLSS quality mode on the 4080 outperforms DLSS performance mode on the 3080. With Ada Lovelace though, a new form of DLSS is introduced with DLSS 3.0 called frame generation. This is where the GPU would take a look at two frames and then calculate what a new frame in between should look like by analyzing in-game motion. It then generates these additional frames, offering you part of the benefits you'd get from running the game at a higher frame rate. It's exclusive to the 40 series, and I tested this with the 4080 and have added the new performance numbers. However, I'm not anywhere near close to being able to make a verdict on DLSS frame generation overall yet, so that'll have to wait for a future video. The Palette RTX 4080 Game Rock OC has a default maximum power limit of 340 watts. In practice, this is around a 335 watt reported power draw in games the remaining few watts likely being used to power other things like the fans. Having used the 30 series cards, this isn't a scary amount of power at all, but I wanted to see how its performance and power usage would scale if I changed its power target. So in this chart you can see that at the default 100% power target, it scored 18,389 in Port Royal, and pulled an average of 329 watts throughout the test. Increasing the power target alone did nothing, with all of the results being within marginal error, Decreasing the power target, you can see that at 90% there's a small but measurable dip in performance that I doubt I'd notice in actual games, but the power draw drops by 8%. Looking at these numbers, I'm very tempted to run this card full time with a 90% power limit, as the power savings are far more appealing to me than the small amount of extra performance. Switching between the two V biases, firstly, the silent mode caps the manual power limit to 100% whereas the slider goes up to 117% on the default performance BIOS. When gaming, the silent mode lowers the fan curve ever so slightly, has slightly higher temps, and slightly lower clock speeds, but if I wasn't hunting for a difference, it would be hard to tell there was one. Honestly though, the card runs so cool and quiet regardless of the BIOS setting that I don't think I'd bother switching it from the default. There's about a 4% difference in fan RPM when gaming, and to hear the difference, I have to get very close to the GPU. By default, this card turns on with a typical rainbowing RGB effect we've come to expect from RGB products. It's a lot brighter than I was expecting though given the darkened gemstones, and very very pretty. Typically though, I don't leave my RGB components rainbowing, so to control and sync this card, Palette has included a cable to connect the card to the addressable RGB header on your motherboard. I want to hate this, 
because it's another cable that you have to try to manage cleanly. However, it's so common to have issues detecting RGB GPUs with a motherboard software, so I actually think I prefer this solution. This way your motherboard would see it just like it would an RGB light strip, and you're far less likely to run into any sort of compatibility issues. The lighting plus the gems can give you some really unique looking effects. The blues remind me of water, reds of magma. I think my favourite card is set to is purple though. But this card is without a doubt one of the prettiest RGB products I've ever played with and I want more than ever to do an ice gem theme build. Like pictures and videos of this card do not do it justice at all. So, it's time to conclude my initial thoughts on the Palette Game Rock OC RTX 4080. Firstly, the Palette Game Rock part. I absolutely love the cooler. It's large, but offers low temperatures and low noise as a result. It also looks stunning and I can't wait to use it in a build. It both presents itself and feels like a premium product, which it should at this price point. Like, I have no complaints here. But, now we get to the elephant in the room. It's price. Prices for the RTX 4080 start at 1269 but just like with the RTX 4090, I expect we'll see cars priced significantly higher than that. New GPU pricing is crazy right now, especially when you consider that the 3080 launched at just £650. But at these sorts of prices, I'm not exactly sure who the RTX 4080 is for. Like, if I was spending £1,300 to maybe £1,500 on a GPU, I would want to be within touching distance of the performance crown. And the 4080 falls short of this goal. Like, it's a very powerful card, capable of some really impressive performance numbers. But the 4090 reigns all over its parade. I'm hoping, though, that in the coming months, as the remaining 30 series stock depletes, and AMD launches its competitor, we'll see prices of the 4080 fall to reasonable levels, and if that happens, then I'll be able to recommend this card. And on that note, if you like this video, please hit the like button. If you want to see more of my future GPU coverage and haven't already, please don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much to my incredible, incredible patrons. And thank you all for watching. Bye bye.